So since I landed up early, I thought that they felt obliged to give me some work. So they said there is the New England Organ Bank, which has a large number of samples of donors over 20 years. If you can get them tested for hepatitis C, uh, this would be remarkable. <clears throat> so I was told where to go. I didn't have a car, but, the, but Boston has a good transportation system, which is called the T. I went to the Brigham. We got these 716 samples tested. And in three days, we had data. So the data showed that 1.8% of organ donors in the past were positive for hepatitis C. And so one day before my official joining day at Tufts New England Medical Center in Boston, we had an abstract uh, in the American Society of Nephrology. We then found that 29 recipients from these organs had gotten hepatitis C. And so then came the second piece of never saying no. So I, through taking buses and trains across New England, I followed those 29 patients and we found that half of them had come down with liver disease. And this was the first demonstration that hepatitis C was transmitted by organ transplantation. And this led to a complete change in organ transplantation policies uh, across the country and now across the world. And I was fortunate that two months after uh, landing uh, in Boston, I had a paper accepted in the New England Journal of Medicine. Next slide, please. We subsequently published many papers in the New England Journal and in many other journals showing that one, hepatitis C is transmitted by organ transplantation, so you shouldn't use hepatitis C positive organs in patients who are negative. <clears throat> we showed that patients who are hepatitis C negative have a course after transplantation which is not as good as those who are not positive. The third is we showed that when you are hepatitis C positive, it doesn't really matter whether you stay on dialysis or undergo transplantation. Uh, there had been a belief that patients with hepatitis shouldn't get transplantation, should stay on dialysis. And this, as I'll show you later, has then translated into uh, clinical practice guidelines. Next slide. So this is Andy Levy. Uh, he's the guy whom I work for. Uh, he's the guy who really taught me just about everything I know in clinical research. Next slide, please. And this is the, these are the groups that we put together over 10 years. Uh, that's the New England Medical Center. These are the fellows who worked with me. These are our statisticians. We brought together the Portuguese Society of Nephrology, the Spanish Collaborators, the New England Organ Bank, and the UNOS National Collaborative Study Group. Together, this group, I'm proud to say, has published between 50 and 100 papers uh, over the last 20 years uh, and has changed uh, policies and guidelines which will improve the lives of patients worldwide. Next slide. Now, like most Indians uh, who land in the U.S., we want to do as much as possible in as little time. So during the day, I was doing a work on hepatitis C, but there was this world-famous researcher called Charles Dinarello, who had, who had discovered or who had identified the first ever cytokine called interleukin-1, and he was at Tufts Medical Center. Now, I read that he had just shown uh, the presence of IL-1 receptor antagonist, and since I thought I didn't have much to do in the afternoons, evenings, and nights, I offered to work in his laboratory. And the good news was that uh, in short period of time, we had a series of papers on interleukin-1, and that led to an NIH multi-million dollar grant. And when my first year was coming to an end, Tufts New England Medical Center said, okay, you know what, you can stay on. And so I said, well, uh, I have three problems. I haven't done a residency or fellowship in the US. I don't have a green card. And the third is, I don't have a license. They said in Boston, everything can be done. So when we, we say in India everything can be done, the same works in the U.S. as well. That if you know the right people, things happen in the U.S. as well. So I got my license, I got my green card in six weeks, and they told me I don't need to do a residency or fellowship in the U.S. Uh, I can become a faculty member uh, without going through that uh, torture. So I said this is a pretty good deal, and I decided to stay on in the U.S. Next slide, please. So over the years, we showed a large number of 
uh, we did a lot, of, a lot of work on the genotypes and its effects on outcomes. Next slide, please. I'm not going to spend much time here. And these are my research fellow and postdocs who have worked in my lab over the last 10 years. Next slide, please. <clears throat> At this point in time, I said that, you know, I'm never going to be uh, the world's best clinical researcher. Uh, I certainly don't have a PhD in the basic sciences. But I could start thinking about something that had been bothering me all along. You know, when patients start on dialysis, most times they have already had their health care deteriorate to such an extent that half the battle is already lost by the time they start dialysis. So I said, we should be able to write a uniform hypothesis that optimizing care before starting dialysis is the key to improving dialysis outcomes. So we published that as a nephrology forum, and this to be, uh, and this is probably one of the best things I feel is that this opened the entire door of chronic kidney disease care. Next slide, please. So we showed a pathway as to how to optimize care of chronic kidney disease patients. Next slide. We showed that patients start dialysis too late. We showed that we allow patients' health to deteriorate so much before we ultimately start dialysis that we are probably not doing a good service to them. Next slide. We also showed that the average patient who starts dialysis in the US is extremely anemic. And we need to correct that anemia. Next slide, please. And we also showed that in the US, cost is very important, that we spend very little before they start dialysis. And it's like a credit card bill that you have never paid on time. You land up paying the bill with interest once they start dialysis. So as a nation, if we can take care of patients with kidney disease well, then ultimately patients will land up in dialysis later. And when they land up on dialysis, they live a longer and healthier life. Next slide, please. We also reminded people through our work that patients who get transplantation also have chronic kidney disease. So it's important to take care of their anemia, their bone disease, their cardiovascular disease, blood pressure, diabetes, and so on. Next slide. And these are uh, my fellows who have worked with me over the years uh, in this field of research. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture of our different team leaders. Next slide. So fast forward, things are going well. I became a full professor in 1997, 98. And I was being recruited uh, to the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard to be the associate chief. When I said, you know what, maybe I'm going to go to business school instead. So I decided to go to Kellogg at, uh, Business School and get an MBA. Because I said, you know, uh, when you're 37, 38, 39 years and you become a full professor, that's a sort of a retirement position. And I thought that I wasn't quite ready to retire. At that time, I got a call from the nominating committee of uh, the National Kidney Foundation saying that, you know, we want to nominate you as the president of the National Kidney Foundation. But remember, uh, nominating uh, the National Kidney Foundation for president is like standing for election in some Central American, uh, Central African countries where you automatically are president once you're nominated. So that's the same with the National Kidney Foundation. And I knew that. I first thought that maybe they had the wrong number. My second response was maybe they called five other people who said no, and I was number six. Nonetheless, I said, Here, here's a great opportunity uh, to make a difference uh, in, uh, in an organization that really changes lives of patients. So I accepted to be president. Now remember, this is a non-paying voluntary job that you do in addition to your day job. Uh, and uh, this was probably uh, the best thing, uh, one of the best things I did. As I say, our day job is what pays the bills. It's the voluntary job that we do that really gives our soul uh, fulfillment. Next slide, please. So over my years as president of the National Kidney Foundation, subsequently, we brought together guidelines as to how to care for dialysis patients. Next slide. We then changed what was called DOKI into K-DOKI, and we brought in the term of chronic kidney disease. That's you need to take care of patients even before they start dialysis. Next slide. Next slide, please. We started a nationwide initiative called the Kidney Early Evaluation Program, where we taught people that if you have diabetes 
or if you have blood pressure or you, if you have a family history of kidney disease, you need to do three simple tests. Check your blood pressure, do a simple urine test for protein and a simple blood test for creatinine by which we'll know. And what we showed is that one in nine people in the U.S. have chronic kidney disease. So it's a major public health problem. And this was the initiative we launched. Next slide, please. We then said that, well, you know, U.S. is one small piece of the global population. We need to take these guidelines globally. But remember, what is done in the U.S. cannot be practical in every country in the world. So we then developed kidney disease improving global outcomes as a global body to develop practice guidelines. And I'm pleased that many Indians, have, nephrologists, have served with great distinction on this and has brought this to India. Next slide, please. So at that point in time, I planned to step down and spend more time with my family, but my family decided that they couldn't tolerate me at all. They talked me out of that. Next slide, please. As I told you, I went to Kellogg Business School. I got an MBA. Next slide, please. And what happened was a week after graduation, my husband was in deep financial trouble and they had fired the chief operating officer and I was called down by the CEO and told that, uh, well, you know, we have fired the chief oper operating officer. So I was wondering, so why am I being told this? So he said, I said, so who is going to be the chief operating officer of the hospital? So he said, you. So I said, okay. Uh, so when do I start? He said, now. So from being a nephrologist with research and clinical, uh, clinical experience that was certainly uh, the chief operating officer of a $500 million uh, budget, which was already $25 million in the red six months into the year. So, uh, you know, one of the good things about us being immigrants is uh, no challenge is something that we can't encounter. Uh, we turned the hospital around. I subsequently became the CEO of the Physician Corporation, and then I got onto the board of a publicly traded company called Advanced Magnetics. And the company was in distress. And so a couple of investors came to me and said, you know what, it may be a good idea for you to leave your job as CEO and run this company instead. So I spoke to my wife. My wife said, why not? So I decided on the 15th of, of November 2005, that I'll quit my job at Tufts New England Medical Center, and on the 16th, I became CEO at Advanced Magnetics, which is now called AMAG Pharmaceutical. It's a publicly traded company. The market cap of the company has varied from 400 million to $1.3 billion. It's been a fun ride. I've learned a lot. I've learned particularly as to what greed is all about uh, in the public markets in the US. Next slide, please. So, I'd like to wind up here. And, uh, and, uh, and, and thank you once again uh, for your generosity in giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, this is my family. I have two kids. Uh, uh, both of them uh, are doing well. As I say, they got their mother's genes. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the good Lord's been good to me. Uh, I have no complaints. Next slide, please. And my last slide is the ethos under which uh, I live. God put us on earth to achieve a limited number of goals. Right now, uh, I am so far behind that I cannot die. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brian Pereira. Uh, we will have a very brief question and answer session. And if any of you wish to ask uh, Dr. Pereira any questions, you're free to do so now. May I request Bharat Kumaraswamy here, please, to take the mic too. So do we have any questions? Right, there are quite a lot of medical, finally medical students and health surgeons in the back. You know, on behalf of them, they may be timid to ask you questions. So, what advice you would give them? You know, you spoke to them, they came a little bit late, you know, how to take the challenges of medicine in life? Well, you know, Dr. Sudhakaran, who's sitting here in front, is better equipped at answering uh, that, that question. Uh, I think I've spoken for 20 minutes to that. I think you have a better way of, uh, of phrasing things than I do. Uh, I actually like the fact I got the mic because uh, even before asking the question, uh, I really want to compliment you on your 
accomplishments. I think in 20 minutes you kind of uh, captured brilliantly what uh, George Abraham said about history. I think it's not that easy uh, for a physician to come into the system unlicensed, no residency. I mean, if I knew that now, I, I'm actually going to go back and start looking up the CV. But, uh, you see, you know, uh, all joking aside, you, you should, uh, I'm uh, very proud of you. I think it's uh, what you've accomplished is absolutely remarkable. Uh, you, you talked about luck. I think that's very true. But I think uh, luck, you know, fortune uh, favors the prepared mind. So you actually were in an excellent position to accomplish what you did. And I think the best advice uh, for the young people and also for anyone else is that, uh, you know, you really have to work hard. There is absolutely no substitution for working hard, however brilliant one might be, uh, however much inspired one is. Uh, working hard is the best prescription for success. And I think you made the other important point is never to quit. Uh, you, you know, it's easy to say you know, when failure is a stepping stone and all that, but in, in reality, uh, never, never quit. You, you fail only when you quit. Uh, you don't fail when you don't accomplish something. It's just some way to prepare yourself to do that. Uh, I think I've kind of exhausted all the profound things I can say, so I'll now shut up and sit down. <laughs>
I, I think uh, Indian healthcare uh, has is like a like a barbell, like a dumbbell. Uh, at one end are the extraordinarily affluent corporate hospitals, which provide as good care as the best hospitals in the U.S. On the other extreme are hospitals which have not really advanced uh, uh, in this hundred years. Uh, what's available there is what was available 50 or 100 years ago. So for the extremely rich, uh, they have the best access to care. For the extremely poor, not much has changed. Now, in some ways, this happens in every country. Uh, there is a divide. But in countries such as India and China and some of the developed countries, our economic progress has far outstripped our social uh, uh, responsibilities. So the challenge for us in India for the future is we can never eliminate this. But how do we put public uh, uh, health and governmental regulations in place? I think we need to start at the start. We need to get a better balance in the quality of medical education. In India, the medical education varies from superb at the All India Institute, BGI, Valor, and so on of this country, to terrible uh, at uh, some of the other institutions. Second is once when people practice, the day you get your MBBS certificate stamp, it doesn't matter till you die what you do. You have no obligation for periodic uh, uh, renewal of your license. Your license is for life. Uh, even our driving license needs to be renewed in India, but our medical license doesn't have to be renewed. So that's number two. Number three is there's very little accountability, which we've been trying to start. But the fourth and the most disturbing thing in India, and I've got first hand, uh, 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 is the amount of graft that he exports. I think the trust of patients in doctors is a vital bond. But when folks get kickbacks, from labs, from hospitals, and pharmaceutical companies for referring patients, that shakes the fundamental social uh, and religious ethos that we have. And so these are the four things we need to tackle. But I think more importantly, a time has come when we need policies in place. We have hundreds of thousands of people who die in road traffic accidents every year. Their organs are cremated, their organs are buried. We need a national policy that has what's called uh, presumed consent. That unless someone objects, we assume that the person wanted to donate his or her organs. We can't afford to give dialysis to tens of millions of people in India. But what we can do is bring governmental measures where when a patient dies, <coughs> Their consent for organ donation is presumed to be. We could be doing hundreds of thousands of kidney transplants, liver transplants, heart transplants. So we need a social and political will to take the right steps in the right direction. I, I hope I didn't preach too much. No. We uh, have time for just maybe one or two questions. I think uh, Bala and then Dr. Um, sure. Brian, uh, hi. I just want to ask you, you've been uh, in a uh, utopian profession like medicine, now switched into a greedy profession like the pharmaceutical